was hoping I wouldn't have to announce this, but um, uh, partials, dental partials were lost on Sunday. Um, and they were given to me. So if you lost your dental partial, um, please, please, nothing to be ashamed of. I know you paid a lot for those things. Um, so, so just come to me and I'll, 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 I'll try not to laugh. I'll give them back to you uh, very discreetly. And uh, we'll move on with our lives. If you know anybody who's missing a set of teeth or a portion of their teeth, uh, let me know. Let them know to contact Pastor Wood. Okay. So at the end of the Bible study, um, I'll try to remember to announce that uh, too. Did, did anybody lose any? Oh. Raise your hand now. No, I knew you were right there. But anyway, all right. Let's go ahead and jump into the lesson um, tonight. I want you to really think about God's mandates. Really, are common sense. I think uh, many of us were brought up, our parents said, just a common sense, especially our grandparents. Um, maybe they couldn't read the Bible like we can. And that's what concerns me. We have very educated people. We still have some that struggle with reading. But for the most part, you know, people can make it through the 66 books. But some of our forefathers, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, maybe couldn't even read. But they had common sense. Uh, and I believe God puts common sense. And so as we go through the laws tonight, um, we're going to see just common sense things. So I want you to ask yourself, why do we mess up common sense things? And, and the big thing is overshadowing. We're going to deal with sin. When sin came in, those things that should be very logical, um, should be a good choice, became the opposite choice. Um, just today, I heard on a report on uh, transvestite. Um, they, it was a male. Um, they moved him to a female facility. There at the female facility, uh, he tried to get a lady that's there. So now they have to move him to solitary confinement. We made life so confusing. And this is all because of sin. We don't know what to do. We see it in our government. We see it in our homes. We see it in our kids. We see it in ourselves. So last time, we got to Exodus, um, that 21st verse. But I kind of want to just review a little section tonight, starting at the 18th verse. Remember the people become afraid of God's presence because this is a very uh, good transition to the law. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. For God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So this transition period is, the people are trembling. They are afraid. God and Moses began to connect and talk to one another, and now we see this transition of the law. Someone please read 22 and 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus. You shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked to you from the preface. You shall not make anything to be with me. God of silver, of God of silver, God of gold. You shall not make it for yourself. What do we get out of this scripture? This is very important to the note. What do we get out of this scripture? All right, don't, don't set up any idols. Why? No other gods before him. No other god before God. And this is tough because there's so many things in our lives that we hold on that we really elevate to God. And I think we all have to ask ourselves, you know, what do we hold on to so strongly? Is there anything that's stronger than our love for the Lord? And that's the key. You've got to think about everything, that which is physical, relationships. Does God, is he the preeminent one within our lives? And this is what God is saying. You've seen how powerful and strong I am. And all of these warnings that he gives to the Israelites, I'm going to give you some insight on this. He already knows that they're going to do it. Right? He tells them before they do it. Now, this is important to the note. He warns them, don't do it. But he knows just by warning them to not do it, what do people do? Why is that? Why? No common. Don't 
touch the cookie jar. Right? Don't touch the cookie jar. But what happens? The flesh. Just because you said it now, it becomes a challenge. Notice this. You, have, you shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. Now, we're going to get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm pressing forward, but we're going to get deep into the wilderness. And remember, Moses is going to be talking to God. And they're going to go and do exactly what God tells them not to do. Idols are a real thing. Um, right down the street... That is an idol, a huge idol. You go down the street to the end, make a left, right where Denny's used to be going down there, you'll see another idol. That's an idol. But idols don't have to be big. They can be small too. We talked about it. He referred to it in other Bible studies, rabbit foots. All these things we hold on to, lucky charms. They can become gods in our lives. We've got to be careful. Yes, sir. Right here. And that's how you know the Bible is true. Who would think that we would have idols of such in the day's time? Technological smart people. But we do. That, that's just the cycle. Smart people worshiping idols. We talked about it. Crucifix. We've got to be very careful. All of that can become an idol for us. Look at this next part. Exodus 20, 24 uh, through 26. Someone read, please. The altar of earth you shall make for me. You shall, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offering and your peace offering, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your stool, your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Go ahead and read that first commentary, please. Thank you. The purpose of the law of Moses was to show the people their sinfulness. Next, God graciously gave instructions for the erection of an altar, reminding the people that sinners can, can approach God only on the ground of shed blood. The altar speaks of Christ as the way of approach to God. Everything he puts down as a bridge, it connects to the New Testament, it points to Christ. The law was given to show forth what? Man's or woman's. Why did God put the law? When he put the law, what did it show? Our sinfulness. That's what it did. Because if there was no law, then man and woman would know their sin. There would be no imputation of that sin. But when the law is put, when they say 55, speed limit, and you choose to do 75, you broke the law. If they wouldn't put that 55, I grew up on a Kansas County area, and I would go down them streets, and I wouldn't see no speed limit. So I just moved. I was like, I'm okay. Until I saw that other one that said, if you don't see one, it's 35. Otherwise, no, 35, I'm like, oh my goodness, the law is put there. So that whole process here, we have to deal with the law. He's telling the children of Israel. That second part, go ahead, Diane, man could. Man can contribute nothing to the perfection of Christ, either by tools of personal effort or the steps of human achievement. Priests descending steps in long, flowing garments might accidentally expose themselves in a manner that would be inappropriate for such a solemn occasion. Wow. Now, remember we talked about clothing? talked about that process, and we're not putting a link, but there is appropriateness. Even within the scripture, God said, I don't want to look upon your nakedness. He said, when you approached me in that Old Testament, you had to come in a certain way that you would cover yourself, that you would be covered. Very important to note. Also, he talked about that hewn stone. You should not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you are profane it. God was saying, I don't need your hands to make me anything. That goes to the New Testament, that it's not by works, lest any man should boast, but it's the gift of God. God has always been a grace giver. We cannot work our way to heaven. We cannot work our way to righteousness. He was pointing to the fact, the only way we can be righteous is through Jesus Christ, his son. And we're going to see that over and over. So in essence, 
and I say this in quotation, the law is put forth that we're going through to show that they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Because if they could do all of the law, then there would be no need for Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why salvation is so important. And my concern for the day's time, we get so upset when people do immoral things. Mm -hmm. But if you're not saved, what else do you do? Right? If there's no standard, you, you know some of you grew up in a good home and you had a Holy Ghost fear, fire baptized mom and dad, and you were still a heathen. Can I get one amen? amen? Think about these folks that never went to church, that their parents were heathens and their grandparents were heathens. What are they supposed to do? They do what the heathens do. So why are we getting upset? A pig is going to be a pig. My concern, where is the church? When the church is acting like pigs too, that's my concern because now there's no light. And so we've got to make sure we're the light. That's why the law is put forth here. Look at this next part. God is concerned about every aspect of our lives. Everything. Nothing slips from his eyesight, his view. We're going to see that with the children of Israel. Someone read 21, 1 through 3, please. Now these are the judgments which you shall set for them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go, free, go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. Go ahead and read that commentary, please. The personal rights of indentured Hebrew servants are lawfully protected in this section. He is not the perpetual property of his master, but will be freed after six years of labor. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. So even with the thought of servitude, God said, okay, I know some people are going to be in debt. Um, they're going to have to work out that debt. But I'm going to make sure that they're free after what? Six years. Six years. Some of you are like, wish we had that now. Because the debt that y'all did, you're like, hallelujah. But see, the issue with that, even for the mindset today, you know, some of you would go, well, I'm going to be released in six years. So you run up your debt bill so you can just kind of move on to the next thing. And so it's all a part of the heart. Yes, ma'am. Actually, they do follow that a little bit nowadays. It's oh, really? called 72 months finances of your car. But the issue is we get into the six years of labor with our car, but then we go into six years of labor with our credit card that starts a year after that. Right. So our, our, our debt just continues on and on and on. Wow. <laughs> In slavery, over and over, servitude. Yes. There's something very interesting about this, like one more that uh, that gave to uh, as compared to the I have realized that most of the laws that come to be today are based on the way we live our lives. Because sometimes if you look at the laws that the police put in place, it is based on something that happened. And somebody has done something that they realize if you don't put a check on it, pretty much it will be uh, uh, something that you just they do it into so much life that we lost. That's why they put still live, like I said. So sometimes it's our own doing that brings about law. Correct. When I was in the military, the military always tell us that because of the way we live our lives and the people things that we do, that is why they put laws in place, so that they make us very visible. So you don't do things you're not supposed to as a, a military uh, person. Right. So, I mean, I just want to just put that in the point that the children of Israel, like God has done that because of the way they are living. So he put that in place so that at least they could check them. It's the same thing as we today. I believe the life that we live today determines what kind of laws they put in place to put us in check. Keeping peace in the community. That was the focus. Look at this next part. So that slave, uh, that servant comes in by himself, he leaves by himself. If he comes in married, brings his wife into slavery, he leaves with her after that six years. Look at this next part. Someone read four through six, please. If his master has given him a wife, and she has born the son of the daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant comes and says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, and his master shall bring him to the judges, he shall also bring him to the door to the doorpost. What you get out of this? <laughs> Actually, it is. Um, I've done some study about that. I had a concern years and years ago about ear piercings because males. It was you know usually this ear piercing with males. This is a kind of a new generation thing. When I grew up, it really wasn't near the early years, and then it went to the left ear. Then all of a sudden, there were radical people went to the right ear, and then both ears, and then all of your face. 
And so, all, really, that's, that's what it is. I see the progress over here. Really, I'm serious. Just this tattoo. When I grew up, when I was little, it was only military that had tattoos. And they got them because they got drunk one night and they had a little tattoo. And I've seen them progress over the years until people have them all over their lives. I've seen the whole cycle of it. So this whole process here, as we look here, he says that if that person comes in and now we're getting in that slavery, what did the master do in that first part? If he did, what did he do? Gave him a wife. Um, I've had to do a lot of marriage counseling and things of that sort. And some people ask me, is my soul made, you know, on, my, on the way and everything. And I pretty much tell them, you know what, if you're saved, two people are saved, y'all can work it out. Amen. Really. I, I just be honest with it. That's the, and please don't take me wrong, but, you know, they put two dogs together, one in heat, the other on it, all of a sudden you get puppies. You know, if they don't have to know each other or anything, that's a biological thing that's been put in place. So this whole process here, the master of the house is like, I love my servant, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give him a wife. I'm going to give him a mate. Sounds okay, right? No, our human rights will be all over this. But it worked in that time. But look at this. This is, this is what's going to happen. If the servant claimed says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will what? Because we're talking about that six years. Okay. You got a wife while you were indentured, right? You had children, so he falls in love, so he has to make a decision at this point. Am I going to leave my family? Because the first law said if you came in by yourself, you leave by yourself. Y'all don't like this, do you? But <laughs> I'm telling you, this law, you came in by yourself, you leave. I gave you the wife, so now he has to make a decision, how much do I love? So uh, that Exodus 21, 6, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost. And his master shall do what? Pierce his ear with an off. And what was the purpose of this? It was a sign that that person would be his servant or slave forever. Wow, amazing. Look at this next part. If circumstances made him desire to remain in his master, he pledged this by having an awl, a sharp piercing tool, pushed through his earlobe at the doorpost before the judges. He thereby, he thereby signified obedience to that household. So that hole in his ear showed forth that he was a slave of that master forever. Here's history. Look at this next part. Uh, 21, 7 through 11. Someone read. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as a male slave do. Uh, if she does not please her master, who has withholded her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to the foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has both he told it her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, her marriage rights. And if he does not do this thing for her, then she shall go out free for her paying money. <laughs> All right. One thing I want you to notice, notice here again, we're talking about slavery. Um, this is big within our society. Durham, Charlottesville, all these things that are going on. People are in a frenzy over this, confederate. But you know what? Slavery just didn't come about. There were slaves in Africa, slaves in America, slaves in the Old Testament. But God still, he's not saying this is right, but he knows our heart. And so he puts laws and parameters in dealing with slaves. And I'll be honest, I really studied this. We may not have, you know, slaves in the thought pattern in the United States as Kunta Kinte or things of that sort. But we got slaves because anytime someone is over you and you're indebted and they call the shots on you, you are under them. Um, any, anytime somebody can kick you out of your house, 
you are under somebody. And I think we need to realize that. I think that we're in an educated slavery now. <laughs> I, I really, really, I do. Because there's a slavery where you knew you had change, you had to do what the master said, and now we think we're in charge, but really somebody else controls our destiny. Right? And you can find out, and I'm not, I just want y'all, you know I teach being debt free, but I always want you to think, if God right now told you, I want you to be a missionary in Haiti, and I need you to leave tomorrow, could you do it? And, and that shows you how much the world has you as a slave. Really, I know we had to get things in order, but would there be debts and everything? Could you quit your job and still have your bills paid and everything and be free to do what God was calling you to do? Not many people can say that because we have become so uh, entrusted to the world. We've married the world. We've become slave of the world. And that's a sad state to be in. And I'm feeling it, uh, even amongst the saints, the stranglehold. It's more and more. Churches are there. Uh, that's why I, I fight so much with Ebenezer to keep us debt free because I don't ever want because if there's a disaster that hits, if there's a majority of people that lose their job, if we're in a whole bunch of debt, guess what? Stranglehold. We can't assist and then we're begging for money just to keep the church lights on. That's not what God called us to be. So now we're thinking about we never want to be under that slavery. Look at this uh, whole commentary. In the case of a female slave, she could not go out free in the seventh year if her master had taken her as a wife. Yeah, a lot of stuff going on. Wife or concubine and was willing to fulfill his responsibilities to her. If he was not willing, she had to be redeemed, but not sold to Gentiles. If he wanted her as a wife for his son, then he had to treat her as he would any daughter-in-law. If the master took another wife, he was still responsible to provide for the slave girl and to give her full marriage rights. The latter probably means nothing more than living accommodations. Otherwise, she must be free without paying money. The fact that God gave legislation concerning slavery does not mean that he approved it. He was only protecting the civil rights of the... That's all just protecting the civil rights of the enslaved because many of these people got into slavery because of debt. Literally, what happened, they got into debt, however, and they couldn't pay their debt. So, what would the creditor do? Come get you. See, y'all, see, y'all, we live in a great day. We, we get our cars repossessed, our house repossessed, they get our clothes, but they really can't touch us. But that, in that day, you were an asset. So if you couldn't, you didn't have any cars, land, donkeys, mules, or whatever, you became the mule. And you worked for the master for those six years, and then, according to the law, you would be set free. That would teach you something, wouldn't it? Maybe we need to institute that again. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, the law concerning violence, uh, 12 to 14. Any comments, questions? Someone read, please. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall show be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may sleep. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor, to give him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Our legislator, I believe, um, they need to read the Bible more often. Right? And there was a time that our Supreme Court, all our judges, were required to read the book. Because that's how they would have an understanding of how to legislate law, how to understand law. Go ahead and read that commentary, please, there. God, the difference, help me out, that's the word, um, between, my mouth is stuck tonight, between somebody dying, how it comes about, 
God and even our laws and our systems, we understand manslaughter. We understand premeditation. We understand all of these things. So God brings this law to the Israelite community. Remember, he knows how these people's hearts are. He knows they're going to have to deal with this. So since they're going to have to deal with this, let me go ahead and sanction what needs to be done. Now look at this next part. Uh, this, is, this is amazing. This just shows you the depravity of their hearts. Someone read 15 through 17, please. And he, and he his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, son. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many dead folks would that be in here tonight? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this more often, really. Parents are coming to me and they're saying, my, my child cursed me. And I do. I just, I kind of turn on the inside. When I hear that, I'm like, oh my, oh my goodness. You know, this is past just going out when your parents and say, will you curse your parents? Um, I, I do. Even in, in our church, older kids that have grown up become adults um, came back home and have cursing their parents. Jesus. I'm like, you don't know. You're cutting your life short really, really quick. We see here parenthood was especially protected by uh, making the striking of one's father or mother a crime punishable by what? Yeah. Kidnapping and cursing one's parents was also capital Crimes. God puts all of this because of sin. Look at this next part. Exodus 21, 18 and 19. Someone read, please. If men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, he does not die, but is confined to his table. If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him. <laughs> Common sense, but God has to put it down because people always try to do loopholes. Go ahead and read that commentary, please. If a man injured another in a quarrel, he was responsible to pay his loss of time at work and also his medical expenses. <laughs> but isn't that what our insurance tries to do? Yeah. Right? Who's at fault? Who caused the injury? You know, if you're, you're, you're working, you know it's a big thing. If you get injured on the job, you're going to have to go through a review. And yeah. Were you injured before you came to the job? Was it your fault? Didn't you see that puddle of water there? Was there something over it? Because they're trying to figure out who's going to have to pay for your time off. Who's going to have to pay? Who's going to have to do that? That whole process. And God understands this. He's like, okay, y'all are going to fall out sometimes. But if it goes too far... And someone loses work because remember, this is all tied to if this person has a debt and he can't pay the debt, then he's going to have to go into slavery all because you decided to fight. And so God said, no, we got to fix this. We got to see how this came about so we can prevent this person from going into slavery and you can pay for his time off. All of these things tie together. It makes for a quiet and peaceful community. God puts these laws. But when you start out with laws, you got to continue on. Look at this 21, 20, and 21. Someone read. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is proper. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Thank God for Jesus, right? <laughs> Some of y'all be messed up. Y'all would, you know y'all would, sin. <laughs> you know, some of y'all ain't gonna die. That's what it said. It, it was a, he had some tough slaves. They got beaten. You, I'll probably be one, I'll be out. You beat me one time. Oh, he, he was a good slave, but some was gonna stick around. Go ahead and read that commentary, Andrew, please. A master could punish a slave, but he did not have the right to kill him. If a servant died immediately after a beating, the master was guilty. But if the slave lived a day or two, the master was not punishable because he obviously did not intend to kill a slave who was worth money to him. 
Y'all ain't know this is in the Bible. Look, y'all like, wow, y'all skipped over this stuff. I know. But God had to sanction these things. He had to deal with that because that's where the man's heart is. That's where the woman's heart. These things occurred. And remember, it wasn't like the man just went and got a slave. This came out of getting in debt, owing somebody something. Some of these people willingly said, I'll be a slave to you. Because that's how they made money. I'll do. And we see it in our society, I'm telling you. Um, drug addicts, many of them have sold their bodies and their souls to support their habits. We see it over and over again. Some people have a love of money and have sold their lives all for money. I was talking to a young gentleman uh, the other day. Uh, he had a great job. He's getting ready to make $150,000 a year, but his life is gone. It's gone. And, and I talked to him about that. I said, are you? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm excited because I get all this money. I said, but you don't have a life. I have a close friend who was making uh, you know, a quarter million dollars a year, but he would fly all over the world. And he had no life. It was so bad, I would call him on the phone. Where are you at? He was like, I don't know. Let me check my hotel door. <laughs> Great money. Lots of money coming in. But if it's killing you, you're a slave to your job. So this whole process here, these people got into it. So God was like, okay, I didn't never wanted them to be in this situation. But let's put some, some laws so at least they can live a life of of civil civility, uh, that they can have a, a place of peace in the midst of this slavery. Look at this next part, uh, Exodus 21, 22. Someone read, please. This man thought and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, that no harm follows. He shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, mm. and he shall pay as the judge determines. <sighs> Every aspect. So these, these Hebrews, they like to fight. We see that over and over. They had to get into it. So God said, okay, this is what happened. So what happened in this scripture? What, what occurred? Yeah, so uh, men are fighting, doing that. Robes are going everywhere. And so we already seen it. The wife, she steps in. Please, don't hurt my husband. He's the breadwinner. And all of a sudden, they get out of her face, and all of a sudden, she goes down. And because of that strike, baby comes. So who's at fault? So God has to put all this together. Look at that comment commentary. If a pregnant woman was hit as a result of a fight between two men, and she gave birth prematurely, though there was no serious injury, then her husband named the amount of the fine, and the judges arbitrated these cases. Right? So we see all this reciprocity. It had to take place because this is the righteous judge. God is the righteous judge, so he puts these things. If this happens, this is going to have to occur. And what I want you to see in your life, how much stuff have you gotten away with and haven't paid for you? That, that's important because that's where Christ comes in because just when we think oh I got this you know and then we start to go back to our past all the stuff that really we haven't paid for yet and we're like thank God for the blood of Jesus really because the righteous judge says whatever you did wrong you, you have to be judged for that wrong that's what all these laws say. So we think about our lives, all the things that we have done wrong. Have we really paid the price for everything that we've done wrong in our lives? No, I haven't. Thank God for His grace. Look at this next part. Was there some hands? This next part, uh, 23 through 25, someone read, please. So if any part follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, two for two, hand for hand, foot for foot, bird for bird, wound for wound. Some countries still follow this. Yes. They do. Thank, thank God for Jesus. And, and I really think um, we're getting back to this kind of world. Do what you want to do. Uh, this is what's happening in High Point with the games. That's why so many boys and girls are being killed. It's an eye for eye, two for two. You get me, I'm going to get you more. I'm, I'm not, and, and this is the issue. Really, it's not just an eye for eye. It's like, you take my eye, I'm going to take your eye, your tooth, and your foot. 
And then <laughs> we're just kind of going back. Who can take more so that it'll stop? And it never stops. Look at this next part. Someone read that first commentary in general. Penalty should what? Fit the crime. The penalty should fit the crime. That, that's supposed to be our legislation. Even now, the penalty should fit the crime. But we even see, even in our society, it's changing. If you got a lot of money, your penalty may not fit the crime. And, and that's, what, that's what's happening at this point. When you don't have God in your life, it's hard to make these righteous judgments. And I'm seeing so much inequity. And I'm, it's not just with black men. I'm seeing why. I'm just seeing our whole system is falling apart. Because when we throw out our moral law and our moral law giver, who makes the rules? Right? Anything goes. It's basically whoever's in charge at that time and what they feel is right. They set the law and rule. And, and you can get anything. And that's where our society is going. It's a, it's a quick slide. I've never seen a, sl a slide like this. But it's because when you throw out those moral laws, those understanding, because Christ is what puts the law in our heart. All right? So only thing that keeps the heathens, the pigs, kind of living a righteous life is to having solid laws that can be enforced. When you take away solid laws that can be enforced, you get anything. It's the wild, wild west. Anybody look at those wild, wild sin? It's the, it's the person who had the biggest gun and can shoot the quickest. That's, that's the society that uh, we go to without the law of God. Uh, look at this, this next part, Numbers 35, 31. Someone read, please. More you shall take no ransom for the life of murder who is guilty of death. Yeah. All right, so most things should be could be paid by a fine, but this one, which is yeah. killing someone, murder, you couldn't buy your way out of it. But now you can. I ain't going to call nobody's name. But you know people have got out of murder. We saw it. You just don't get in the car and just go down the street and keep running and the police will follow you and you ain't doing nothing wrong. You just know. I ain't calling no name. I just said. You just know. And so all this process, money makes a difference. It really does. Don't you try doing it. Don't nobody try doing it here because I will be visiting you. Whether you did it or not, I will be visiting you. I guarantee you. Yes. Yes, man. That was the hand. Yes. Run going. Uh, one back to you said the previous one. Is uh, like that uh, nurse who was trying to follow the law and the rules of her job, and the police officer decided at that point that he didn't care. He was angry. He wanted his way, and so he, in his, he superseded the law for what he felt was right. You're right, and that's happening. You know, racial profiling, whatever, and we can get all upset about it, but all of us racial profiling. Mm -hmm. You're right. You going down the street in the dark, you see certain people, you're like, ooh. Right? You try to figure out, really. You try to, it, 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 it happens to all of us. It's a part of our nature. And if you had a gun and you saw something, you got to make a quick decision. Okay, is this person good or bad? And you know you only got a second to make. Y'all be shooting up everybody. <laughs> you know you would. Don't give a machine gun. You could have shot up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> and then you, oh my goodness, it was my family. That, that's the whole process. We do. We We all do. We do it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We do it to those around. Dark skinned folks do it to light skinned folks. Oh, yeah. You do. When y'all first came to Ebenezer, you did. 
walked in. Oh, I know what kind of folks these are. You looked at their cars, you did. You looked there, you looked at the pews, you made sure. And you know, you was like, okay, all right, yes or no. We profile. Look at this next part, though. God, he has a deal with the heart. 26 and 27, someone read, please. So there's hope. <laughs> so if you're in slavery, it's before the six-year period of time that you get set free, free either, but something happens between you and your master, and he knocks out your eye, what happens? Go free. I'm sorry, this is so funny. It is logical. So when you come up to your master, you say, my eyes go. <laughs> the master's like, <laughs> go, go to the book. Yeah, it's there. God said it. See you later. So, you get a tooth knocked out. You pick it up. Master. Master goes to the law. For the sake of his eye and his tooth, I gotta let you go. What a righteous judge. God putting these laws forth. Amazing to me. All right, so we've dealt with the majority of the issues with mankind, but there's going to be more later. But we got pets, right? We got beasts of birth. They use that, so we got to have laws with them too. You just can't let your animal just run free and hurt somebody. Who's going to be responsible for the brute beast? Someone read that next verse, 21-28. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. What does that mean? He lost his ox. We see this, really. You're, you're in charge of your animal. And we, we, we've seen cases like this. Um, I, I told you someone broke up my car. I came out, and I, I, I saw them out, and I had to make a split decision that my dog was right beside me. Was I going to let my dog go after him? But I realized how a law is. Somebody said, yeah, let the dog go. But I realized something. I control my dog. If my dog would have hurt that person, y'all might have been seeing me on news, too. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Howard Elmos Jr., Ebenezer Baptist Church, assaults a man with his German Shepherd. <laughs> what about the love of Christ? <laughs> you know, I'm serious. You know, I'm like, oh. And you know they're going to get the worst picture of me. They're going to get the one when I got gas. You know, it's like, what happened to him? You know, they're going to make sure. So this whole process here, we got to have some laws so that we can control everything, that ox, if he gores a man or woman to death, then the ox, the ox has to be stoned. When a dog or whatever bites someone, most of the time, they kill them. They put them to sleep. It's a process. They do the test on it, but most of the time they go, okay, he has the potential to do this again. We're going to put him to sleep. We still carry that out. Notice this, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. Responsibility. So now, how much responsibility do we take from this 29 through 32? Someone read, please. But if the ox tends to prosper, it's more in times What can we learn from the above scripture? You know you got a bad animal. You're going to be guilty. <laughs> you know your animal bad. You got a pit bull. Or you know. He don't even like you. The only reason he don't eat you up is because you keep feeding him. And you know. And so you knew this ox had a tendency to gore. And you didn't put the restraints on him. So you're going to be responsible for it. Responsibility. In our society, we're seeing that less and less. People wanting to take responsibility for their stuff. Everybody blames it on everybody else, 
but nobody wants to take responsibility. God was serious about responsibility in the community. Take ownership of what you do. Very, very important. Any comments or questions? All right, let's keep praying. Y'all real quiet. It's cool because I got where I wanted to be at. 33 to 34, someone read, please. If a mind beats a or an ox or a donkey also eats, the owner of the field shall make it to me. It shall be monitored to the owner by the dead animal shall be used. <laughs> Come on, put it in your own words. Anybody? You're breaking your body. I like it. So you dig a pit, a hole, ox didn't see the hole, ox fell in the hole, ox died. So the person who dug the hole gets the dead ox and has to pay the man for the ox. Make sense? Oh, no, we got a Pentecostal over here. She said, just cut them up and run. <laughs> this whole process here is important because it keeps everybody supposedly at peace. Look at this next part. Someone read 35 and 36. One man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it. And the dead ox they shall also divide. For if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in time past, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. Go ahead and read that commentary, please. Personal injuries caused by animals were chargeable to their owners, but if an animal had killed repeatedly, the animal and his owner also shall be put to death. Human life was sacred. Injuries to other animals resulted in finding the offending animal's owner or in his replacing the injured or dead animal. If I have a problem with it? All right, I'm glad you're on that because God has told you accountable for it. This whole process, really, that's what Christ does to us because we, we know when Jesus comes in us, we know what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's why we do go to extra mile. When we offend someone, we hurt someone, we want to make it right. Yes. Because we know that's what love is all about. The world is always trying to not make it right. Cut corners. Get off with little as possible. That's the world's mentality. And if you ever see yourself going at that point, you need to check yourself. First of all, you need to make sure you're safe. Because as a Christian, I know my conscience is prick if I'm trying to cut corners on things. If I've done something wrong, I need to own it, and I need to make it right. And that's the whole process that God is trying to teach them in moral legislation. But still, it points to Christ, the changing of the heart. Yes, sir. That's why I get Amen. That conscience. Let, let's get um, a couple more verses. Uh, let's go Exodus 22 and 1. Someone read, please. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. All right. So now we even got thievery. So you get caught. What, what do you see? What happens, though? When, when you steal that and you get caught, what are you going to have to do? You see it? it? That's why as a Christian, we don't want to do these things, but if we messed up, we go above and beyond. This is what God was teaching them again. He understood they couldn't do it, but it points to what Christ does in our heart. And as a Christian, we have a greater responsibility because that's how our light shines. People know when we go above and beyond. I'm big on tipping. You know, a lot of you, you may go low as you can. You eat a $60 meal, leave a dollar. That's a travesty. And you call yourself, I mean, if you're going to do that, don't do it in church clothes. <laughs> I get thug clothes. Don't have, don't have Ebenezer program. Don't talk about Pastor Woods. Don't, just don't. Don't do it. Because that shows a lot. We go above and beyond. At least that, that what, what we know is right. Look at this next. The last few, we're, we're at 8.15. Uh, two through four. Someone read, please. Is risen on him, death should be guilt for his blood shed. He 
If a thief was slain while breaking in at night, his killer was not accountable. All right? So if somebody comes to my house, I get him at night. Because the lights was out. All right? Boom. He was slain. Hey, don't look at me like that, Diane. I ain't saying I would do that. I love. That's, that's love. So he was not accountable. He had no way of knowing whether the motive was theft or murder. So someone comes in my house, I don't know if you're, gonna, you're trying to kill me or you're trying to take from me, so I take you out first, because it was dark. All right? I don't know if you were white or black or whatever, I just took you out because it was dark. Now there's an issue though, because it says, but to kill a thief during daylight hours brought guilt because now I can see you came to my house and you were trying to take my stuff. You weren't trying to kill me, but I killed you. Now I'm in trouble. So we see this even in our legislative process now. They ask what happened. Did that person use excessive force? So a Reverend Irvin, someone comes in his house, he pulls out his machine gun, he starts shooting up. <laughs> person died. He goes, well, he came to my house. So it's like, wait, yeah, what was he doing? He was scared for his <laughs> Reverend Irvin said, I don't, I don't know. He came to my house. He crossed over. But Reverend Irvin, he's going to be charged for murder in a sense of force because he took his machine gun and shot the man up, and he didn't even see what was going. Nothing happened. Did he come at you? Nope. He just came to my house. Did he, did he touch anything? Nope. He just came to my house. Well, so why are you shooting with a machine gun? So we see these laws I set for to protect, uh, protect those that are even doing wrong. And how they're doing wrong. Right? Very, very important. And that last part, uh, it says, if the thief of verse 1 could not make restitution, then he was what? See, I told you, you got into slavery by usually doing something wrong. So you stole, you didn't have no money, you got caught, you didn't get killed, so you still got to pay back. Now you're a slave. Can anybody say thank God for Jesus? Yeah. Come on, see feet. Let's close out. Study ahead. There's more law. Yeah. 
Uh, you identify? Oh, okay. All right. Well, we got some real hygienists and stuff can look at it. So uh, we gonna find you. And since you didn't say that, then I'm gonna really make you feel bad. All right? We gonna find you. But seriously, if you lost your partial uh, or whatever your customized teeth plan, whatever it is to you. Please, 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 they're, they're on my desk, and I would love to get them off my desk. I really would. Right. What kind of jaw? What, what kind of jaw? He said, he said uh, put them in a the jaw. Yeah, right. uh, I don't want to touch them no more. Okay, let's move on. Um, let's pray for uh, Teresa Good, her friend Orlando Lucas. Um, they're not giving him much longer to live. Uh, so just, uh, he had a kind of a stroke, blood pressure drop, comatose, and brain damage. So uh, please uh, lift up that whole family situation in prayer. Um, let's pray for Frances Evans. Uh, let's lift up Vicki Goins. She's suffering from pneumonia and some other things that are going on in her life. So um, let's just pray a lot of struggles. These hurricanes, hurricanes, uh, three at one time. Um, the, the weather forecasters don't know what's going to happen. Florida, South Carolina is uh, declared a state of emergency. North Carolina, we're concerned. We just don't know. We're hoping it doesn't hit Texas again. Just pray. Just pray. And um, just pray for God's will be done in that situation. It's supposed to hit around Monday or so in this area. So uh, we'll see what God is going to do. Right, so let's just pray for the whole situation. Also, don't forget prayer on Friday. We have intercessory prayer on Friday here at 7 o'clock. Lula Luz will be leading that. So please, if you don't have anything on your schedule, come on out for prayer. Bring your family prayer on that Friday night. Other prayer requests? My son forgot he had surgery today, so I uh, got a whole bunch of teeth taken out, slits here and there. So just uh, pray that he'll recover well. Uh, pray for my brother, uh, Thank you. 